And good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are today. So I will be talking about uh, translation expertise. And of course, the notion of translation expertise has been in studied in translation studies for decades, several decades already. Um, but with this lecture, maybe more generally, I hope to ins inspire you to scrutinize and, and rethink your own notions of translation expertise or translation experts. Perhaps it even inspires you to rethink other established concepts in your specific subfield of translation studies. Uh, that's in a way what I have been trying to do in my own research again and again, questioning my own as well as others established concepts. So, for example, in uh, 1998, I wrote a whole book on translation competence from a theoretical perspective, combining knowledge from translation studies and cognitive science of that time. Um, I like to call this book my youthful folly, Jugendsünde, but really I still almost agree with most of the contents that I wrote at that time. Uh, it's mainly the concept, the concept of competence that I do not use in my research anymore. But in the 1990s, it was very popular to design competence models and to try to squeeze kind of or abstract all translation in one single abstract illustration. So you find mine in that first book. Um, also today, I do not quite agree with my then style of writing. Uh, just like many other translation scholars, I think at that time, I tended to lapse into almost prescriptive style of writing, telling the readers what translators kind of need to know and what they have to know, what they need to do. And after all, who I was, who was I to tell anybody what they need to do or know? Uh, of course, I had been working as a freelance translator. I had done my theoretical research uh, on cognition and translation, but I did not have extensive empirical evidence for my claims yet. So in my 2004, the second book on translations management, translation uh, management or project management, sorry, it's also in German, um, I still use the term translation competence, uh, but I look at it from an empirical perspective now, and I had been studying it empirically. Um, meanwhile, I had my own research group, and in an ethnographic field research project, I, we had been shadowing translators and translation project managers for many weeks and we had interviewed them. So, so now I was able to describe what it takes to work in the translation industry, at least to some extent, with some examples, with some cases. So since then, the book has been um, published in two new editions and for the uh, third edition, 2016, I added a follow-up study of what had been happening in that same translation agency um, in the meantime. And on the theoretical level, uh, while I was working on the 2016 edition, I updated the discussion on translation expertise as a social, a social construction. And also in the meanwhile, Tuja Kinnunen, Kaisa Koskinen, Kristina Abdalla, others had been discussing concepts like translation agency that I also wanted to mention there. So let us look at the current state of research um, on the topic of translation expertise. So in the over the past of uh, last the last 20 years, there have been in, intense efforts, particularly within this uh, TPR translation process research that have produced valuable insights into the skills required of translators. Most of, most of the empirical research to date has been conducted in laboratory settings, and it seeks, for example, to examine cognitive differences between translators with different levels of experience, like novices, semi-professional translators, professional translators, and so on. And the theoretical conceptualizations have been inspired uh, primarily uh, by expertise studies in cognitive psychology. Uh, so in my today's lecture, I 
argue for the need to further contextualize translation expertise, that is, to integrate it into relevant and meaningful situations of practice and of experience. Uh, with contextualization, here in general, I refer to this integration of knowledge and activities in their natural or usual settings, like the actors' uh, lives or workplaces. Um, for example, by observing how they carry out projects, solve real life uh, problems using their these authentic materials and instruments that are encountered in the in those settings. And of course, this perspective also includes any relevant social roles and networks. In the case of translation expertise, it means extending the concept of to include a performative in opposition kind of or in addition to competent uh, competent the idea of competence also the idea of per uh, performance uh, so this kind of a situated perspective and exploring its significance in complex dynamic translation settings and it also enables us to place a particular focus on the critical aspect of the social discursive construction of expert uh, expertise and experts uh, some history in translation studies now. In 1984, Justa Holtz-Mantere described translation as an action realized by an expert. She talked about experten handeln. And since then, and even, of course, earlier, there have been uh, ongoing discussions in the field of translation studies about whether every bilingual or multilingual individual can actually translate or interpret. And most translation studies scholars have suggested that additional skills are required and that a person needs a certain translation competence or expertise in order to work professionally as a translator. So, in that sense, the, all this theoretical and empirical research um, have centered on the aspects that make up such competence or expertise or professionalism. And all these three terms have frequently been used uh, interchangeably, which has also led to the to discussions about the similarities and differences. Some recent Publications call for conceptual clarity and distinctions between these concepts, and several translation process research studies have shown that professionals do not always produce high-quality translations, which is, for example, why Jaskelein and Rita Jaskelein and suggests distinguishing between professional translators who earn their living from translating and expert translators with high-quality, continuous high-quality performance. And Shiv and others discuss this, they call it an awkward coexistence of competence and expertise in translation studies. And for them, um, I quote, the virtual identity uh, in usage of the two concepts leads to an unfortunate muddying of the conceptual waters. They question whether the linguistically oriented concept of competence is still useful and propose working instead with the expertise framework from cognitive psychology. Uh, the term competence long dominated in discussions about the skills required for translation work and initial research in the 1970s, 1980s focused mainly on linguistic skills. Um, many different definitions and models have since followed and progressively included an increasing increasing number of factors beyond language. Um, and these increasingly comprehensive models were often motivated by pedagogics and according to their critics, because became less conclusive with this in increasing scope. For example, Pim and Mark here, put forward opposing models with minimal definitions of translation competence, which were limited to two or three capabilities. And, and both of these um, ideas and some of the multi-component um, models, uh, for example, by the Pacte group and myself, um, they emphasize this process-like character of competence, this doing and experiencing, and demonstrate very 
quite strong similarities to the, this performance-based approach, approach that was used in the cognitive psychological expertise research. I think maybe you heard that uh, in this expertise research, uh, people have been studying especially uh, good performance and performers in, in areas like sports and chess. And they focus mainly on problem solving and speed. And um, according to Shreve and others, it is a more robust uh, theoretical and empirical foundation. Uh, and it has several advantages over the uh, concept of competence. And the expertise framework from psychology now forms a basis for uh, several translation process research approaches. Um, in the expertise performance approach, uh, an expert is often defined as someone who displays consistently superior performance on a specified set of representative tasks for the domain, as, as Ericsson and Charnas call it or describe it. And expertise, as Reef describes this, is the entire set of cognitive resources and abilities that allows consistently reproducible expert performance. Uh, so it is described as something that is acquired over time as opposed to being an innate characteristic. You can learn uh, expertise. And this learning pro process is central to expertise in this uh, approach. And um, while experience also plays a major role, it applies only to, for the type of experience that is characterized as deliberate practice, which is a key concept in this um, approach of expertise studies. Uh, Shreve describes deliberate practice as the regular engagement in specific activities directed at performance enhancement in a particular domain, including feedback and, and an adequate um, uh, level of diffic difficulty and um, um, possibility to make errors, to repeat stuff and so on. And that is approached uh, assumed to be what makes the difference between experts and experienced non-experts. Uh, it was also explained why experienced working professionals do not always produce high quality translations like Jaskelainen, what Jaskelainen was able to show. So not all experienced translators are expert translators in this sense, uh, only those who have engaged in deliberate practice. Um, much of the um, empirical research on translation expertise has, however, used experience as the main criterion for the selection of study participants. And the corresponding studies observe and compare the actions and resulting translations of translators with different levels of experience, as I mentioned, like translation experts, semi-professional translators, students, so on. Uh, and in this view, experts are not necessarily top performance, performers, but rather the more knowledgeable group. So their expertise is relative, whereas this study of absolute expertise would focus on truly exceptional performers and measurable peak performances. But since absolute experts are difficult to identify in the field of translation, who's supposed to uh, name those and on what, with which criteria, it's only logical that empirical research to date has focused in translation studies on relative expertise. This allows researchers greater freedom in the choice of participants, but of course it contradicts this claim that not all experienced translators are experts. Um, still, studies comparing novices to more experienced translators have served to identify several indicators um, that characterize the differences in their performance. Such uh, studies are conducted in experimental controlled settings and they mean, mainly use data acquisition methods such as thinking aloud protocols, eye tracking, keystroke logging, screen logging and so on. And they have shown, for example, that more experienced translators process larger sections of text, they use more reference material, 
they exhibit higher degrees of automation, also task awareness, and also target text and context orientation, uh, higher levels of self-monitoring and self-evaluation than their novice uh, counterparts. However, these aspects only offer a mere, a very brief indication of what translation expertise can mean. And this fact is highlighted, by, for example, by Ricardo Munoz Martin, who adapts a situated cognition perspective and his access to multidimensional construct of translation expertise. His model consists of general and task specific dimensions of expertise, and he aims to describe the nature of translation as a multidimensional situation dependent activity. So with this reconceptualization of translation expertise, Munoz Martin takes a step towards embedding the expertise construct in a complex and dynamic and situated um, working, working reality of translators. He also underlines the, underlines the in, importance of the increased focus on adaptability. Expertise research traditionally assumes that expertise is limited to a particular domain and is not transferable. But um, uh, Munoz Martin um, claims that adaptability or adaptive expertise has a key role in this in this wide wide ranging fields of activity that come into play in the translation sector. So translation expertise could be regarded as the maximum adaptation to task constraints. Experimental research designs in the lab require both the identification of well-defined tasks that are representative of translation activities and the measurement of the performance of transla translators who execute these tasks. The question is, of course, is that possible? It can be argued that translation is by default ill-defined and workplace studies have shown that this heterogeneity has increased because of the drastic changes in translation work environments and tasks in re recent re years. So what, what is actually a, a um, representative task? Also, technological developments, globalized network economy, they have led to a diversification of tasks and tools and work processes and cooperation forms. So in view of this complexity, Alves and Silva, da Silva conclude not only that a great deal of adaptive expertise is needed, but also that it is plausible to come up with external ranking criteria to define outstanding behavior. As they write, even defining expertise in translation is an impossible endeavor from the perspective of a profession or a task. So to resolve this issue, Alves and Da Silva suggest approaching translation not as an occupation or professional activity, task or technique, but rather as a complex skill that is an integral part of several domains. And to investigate the interplay between the translation skill and other skills needed for translating, Alves and Da Silva suggest a sociological construct of interactional expertise that is based on Colin and Evans. Uh, it puts language at the core of expertise or specialist tacit knowledge. Uh, and in this view, translation expertise mostly consists of domain specific discourse fluency, discourse on translation, which is acquired by socialization process uh, processes within groups of experts in the given domain. So these recent developments in conceptualizing translation expertise clear up many of the previous contradictions, and they also pave the way for methodological additions and adjustments. As has been argued in workplace research, for example, by our research group, the dynamics of situated work 
can be revealed, of course, to a greater extent by studies in authentic settings than by those conducted under controlled laboratory or classroom conditions. So we need both. We argue that it's a suitable approach for investigating translator expertise from the view of translation as lived activity, studying it in the field. Uh, research that draws on authentic workplace settings has gained considerable uh, ground in recent years, especially in sociological and cognitive translation research. And um, a key aspect of workplace research is that single texts, individual translators or isolated processes are replaced as units of analysis by rather projects, networks activities in real life workplaces, be they home offices of uh, freelance translators, language service agencies, uh, translation departments, um, virtual translation networks and so on. And, and this enables researchers to investigate the day to day context related work of translators with these all these related tasks and interactions and working conditions. The main, main advantage of this approach is the extension of the co co scope of the research to include all these social or the relevant social material, institutional and technological factors that influence translators and translation processes in the workplace. The theoretical frameworks used in workplace research of this kind are mainly inspired by cognitive science, sociology and also uh, ergonomics. And scholars draw on theories such as situated cognition, actor network theory, uh, practice theory, also organizational studies and of course ergonomics studies or theories. A variety of methods, both qualitative and quantitative, can be used for workplace research. And of course, all of them differ in their degree of formalization, specificity, involvement in the field and so on. In order to grasp as many relevant aspects of one, case, of one single case as possible, workplace research is often ethnographically oriented and entering the workplace and being really immersed in the field as it is um, required in ethnographic research, it tries to enable the researcher to ap approximate this emic insider view and observe a phenomenon in its authentic social setting. Uh, participant observations, interviews or uh, artifact or document analysis are am among the most common methods. Um, still approaches that are quantitative or more distant from the field, such as questionnaires are also possible. Um, also in uh, ethnographic methods can be combined with these traditional translation methods sometimes, such as keystroke or screen logging or eye tracking maybe, or even uh, they can also be combined with laboratory experiments. Um, so despite the different approaches and methods used, common ground within translation workplace research is found in the emphasis on translation as an activity that is more complex than simply transferring text from one language into another. That is, it's uh, situated, it's collaborative, it's artifact mediated, um, and the image of translation work that emerges from such studies is characterized by the influence of um, several layers of context. Even when sitting alone in an office in front of a computer, translators are in constant, uh, constant interaction. They work not only um, with texts, but also with other people and tools and so on. And of course, any developments like glo globalization, digitalization, network economy, they are constantly restructuring translation work. Uh, and these changes can be seen in the increasing heterogeneity of the tasks performed uh, from the translation of certificates to the localization of video games, also in the work processes where 
individuals are integrated into complex higher level processes. Also cooperation form, forms, um, complex distribution of works, virtualization, networking, and also the tools used, um, the information communication translation technologies, language technologies. And they also in, indicate a move from an individual to a network level. The translation process is increasingly mediated by different people and instruments in a progressively longer and larger chain of uh, events and, and even larger and more complex networks. Um, so modern day organizational structures tend to be decentralized and include the outsourcing and offshoring of translation services. Uh, In-house positions for translators have lost ground to corporations with agencies and freelance translators. And translation expertise does not remain untouched by all these dynamics uh, and the recent changes that have brought to the workplace. Um, this calls for research on expertise in lived work as it is lived as part of organizational life by those who do it, uh, as Har Button and Harbour describe it. And so it um, calls for a decided, decidedly different framework from than, than the experimental settings that have so far primarily been used in translation process research to study expertise. Uh, current key topics in translation studies, workplace research, include work organization, routines, cognitive, organizational, physical economics, cooperation and social dynamics, and also the use and implications of technologies. This is, uh, um, this is being done uh, to a high extent at the moment. Uh, however, workplace studies on translation expertise exclusively or explicitly are not an established tradition. Um, recent workplace studies that offer promising prospects for the examination of lived expertise include, for example, the Flus study on uh, EU conference interpreters and Maeve Olohan's study in the translation department of a research organization. Um, both are ethnographically oriented and observe day-to-day -day working practices from within the field. Um, they do not deal with expertise in the stricter sense, but Duflu draws on the community of practice approach, and Olohan proposes a, a um, practice theory reconceptualization of knowledge as know knowing in practice. But compared to the wealth of experiment-based studies on translation competence or expertise, studies on this leave translation expertise are few and far between. The question is, how do those who work in the translation sector conceptualize expertise? Um, for example, Angelone and Marin Garcia and also Tiselius and Hilt recognize this research deficit and emphasize the need for sociological and ethnographic studies conducted, conducted uh, in um, translation contexts. These would accommodate not only a situated interactional understanding of expertise, but also allow scope for the emic understanding of translation expertise. Interestingly, the few studies that have been carried out in this area by translation and interpreting scholars reveal a somewhat different picture to the one suggested by the theoretical or experimental expertise research. For instance, in interpreting studies, the results of the uh, semi-structured interviews con conducted by Michaela Albel Mikasa and the in-depth uh, interviews carried out by Elisabeth Tiselius with professional interpreters, they suggest that deliberate practice is not an important factor, is such an important factor in, in their acquisition of expertise as had maybe pre previously been assumed. And similar results are also obtained um, in this only 
translation studies survey to date that focuses on this specific topic of translation expertise. It was conducted by Angeloni and Marin Garcia, and the results uh, of this survey of professional translators and project managers indicate that little importance is attached to the to deliberate practice in the acquisition of translation expertise, particularly given this general lack of, lack of suitable conditions to support this in the workplace, having feedback uh, and so on. So several other differences are also apparent between these ethic conceptualizations of ex expertise within the translation process research community and the emic understanding in the working world. For example, the translators and project managers who participated in that survey, they focus more strongly on handling matters relating to the work context and parameters like punctuality, interaction, dialogue and so on, than on the quality of the work or even top performance. They consider quantitative productivity to be at least as important as quality in the sense of a high value, well functioning product. Also, the study shows the high importance of adaptability on a variety of levels. The activities the translators are engaged in are numerous and diverse. Not only do they sometimes translate, translate outside their areas of specialization, of course, but they also view their job more as more than just translating kind of in a narrow, very narrow sense of the term, of course. Uh, so it also includes proofreading, editing, localization and so on and so on. And they also have to adapt to different kinds of media and clients and particular expectations um, and other situational constraints. So these results hint at the potential of field research in translation on translation expertise. Um, firstly, Angeloni and Marion Garcia's stud study reveals a rem remarkable difference between the definitions of expertise used in translation studies research and those used in pro uh, by professional professionals in the language industry. So their initial investigation demonstrate that adopting a lived work perspective offers strong potential for gaining new insights. And secondly, there's the question of the importance of uh, understanding expertise also as a social construction. The different the perspectives on expertise that are held in the academic and working worlds, and also the differences within the working world um, show that expertise is not a stable universal category. While some of the views express, expressed by the project managers and translators that were surveyed by Angeloni and Marin Garcia, they partly correspond, others are completely different. So expertise can actually mean something different for each individual, individual which doesn't make it arbitrary, of course. It's just the situated context dependent um, development. And this calls for an examination of the sociocognitive factors that bring about the different conceptions of expertise, translation expertise. And thirdly, uh, it becomes apparent that translation as work or as a task must be perceived as a complex and dynamic collaborative activity involving several people, different ideas and expectations. Uh, translations, translators do not only carry out a number of different activities that relate directly to the text, they also spend a significant portion of their time on social and technological, administrative tasks, communicative tasks. So further research is needed to investigate how these social and environmental interactions shape and also how they are shaped by the actors conceptions of translation expertise. Um, an approach outside translation studies that I find very promising in this context is Sutton and Bicknell's view of expertise as embodied experience in the cognitive ecologies of skilled performance. For them, skills and expertise are multi-level composite phenomena, which 
the often uh, strongly compartmentalized expertise research fails to account for. Uh, in addi addition to focusing on specific aspects of skills in laboratory settings, Sutton and Bicknell success investigating the embodied experience of real expert performance in uh, real domains of practice as they deploy richly embedded strategies in full and challenging ecological settings. Um, their method of choice for doing so are observations and self-reports, because when you combine first-person and third-person accounts of an activity, uh, and also qualitative and maybe quantitative data, it allows the creation of that kind of a multi-layered image of expertise in context. Um, expertise as embodied experience is considered both, both over time and at a time. So over time means, uh, over time means that experts are, uh, uh, that you study the history of practice, uh, where these experts have acquired skills and how they inscribed these uh, skills into their bodies and at a time as their performance in a certain moment when they deploy those, those skills. Um, of special interest are challenging and changing situations and the contextual cues that are essential, I quote, um, when experts access and deploy relevant situational knowledge to influence and adjust their well-honed embodied skills in real time." End of quote. So Sutton and uh, Bicknell illustrate this real-time adjust adjustment with the example of a cyclist's account of her winning sprint in an elite bicycle rate, race. Sorry. Um, and her embodied experience allows her to cope with unpredictable challenges, to interpret contextual cues within a short amount of time, to know immediately uh, what she can do, what she cannot do, what she might be able to do, and eventually then decide the race in her favor. Um, like I mentioned a great deal of expertise research also here. So Sutton and Bicknell make reference to sports. Uh, I think, however, that the embodied experience approach should also or could also enlighten translation expertise research because it ties well in this 4EA approaches to cognition and translation. 4EA, I mentioned in my last lectures, the embodied, embedded, inactive, extended and affective approaches, and it offers concrete ideas for investigating lived and in, uh, embodied expertise, ideas that we could use. Um, research on translation expertise in authentic context has so far mostly focused on uh, workplaces. However, from a lived expertise perspective, the context does not have to be limited to workplace settings. It can be extended to include, include of course, non-professional translators, amateur translators, translation practices uh, of that kind. Um, one of the very first studies in this area was carried out by Ain and Ain, who held semi-structured interviews with volunteer translators. Um, in an LGBTIQ migrant community project that was. Um, and some of these volunteers considered themselves as translating translation experts and some did not. And the study reveals the discourses by with which both groups construct the boundaries between experts and lay people. So their constructions of experts and non-experts, these identities are often based on personal backgrounds such as educational, professional work experience and um, subject knowledge maybe. Uh, in and Ain's theoretical approach is inspired by sociology of science and they draw on Gearin's notion of boundary work. Um, this concept of boundary work describes the identity forming and boundary drawing processes linked to this expertise discourse. 
Uh, so separating experts from non-experts serves to build identity and status and to create differences and, and distance also. So similar to Gurbic, Nadja Gurbic and Pekka Kujamaki of the University of uh, Graz in Austria, in and in also argue that the common distinctions in translation studies between professionals and experts or amateur translators, lay people, uh, should be questioned. They know that note that the uh, research focus on professional translators fails to consider the majority of translation activities. So those all those that take place outside a professional and paid context. They also reject the notion of expertise as a self-evident or objective category. Uh, N and N see it as something that is produced interactively by experts and lay people alike as they engage in boundary work around who counts as an uh, around who counts as an expert and who does not. They success distinguishing between a conceptualization of expertise that relates to the construction of identities through boundary work and one that relates to specific translation practices, describing the, these practices as knowledge practices that are situated and embodied, a uh, sort of knowledge that is rather performed than possessed. In and Ain's approach offers a fruitful foundation, I think, for research into lived expertise, as it brings together two dimensions that at first glance do not seem very compatible. Expertise is seen on the one hand primarily as a social construct, a view that is shared in sociological research into expertise, professionalism, and also elites, and in partly by other approaches to expertise in context. But also expertise, well, expertise is a social construct that separates experts from non-experts. And in that sense, it aims at social closure and it serves as a discourse of occupational control. Still, in and in also do not disregard the idea that people engage in certain practices that enable them to perform their tasks successfully. Their notion of knowledge practices displays many parallels to Ricardo Munoz Martin's concept of situated expertise or also Maeve Olohan's practice theory perspectives on, on knowledge. So in and Ain's approach connects within with the re recent discourse in translation studies and offers a fresh and critical perspective on translation expertise, namely as a social construct. And their findings suggest that the social construct does not necessarily consider which knowledge practices people engage in. Both experts and lay people reflect on their work on a meta level. A binary distinction between experts and non-experts based on educational or professional work experience about, uh, apparently does not do justice to the diverse web of knowledge practices in which people actually engage in. Um, instead, it is a product of boundary work that is carried out not only by experts, but also by non-experts, and of course also by the academia. Uh, there's a long history or in translation studies of drawing lines between expert and non-expert of translators. Um, translation studies scholars and professional translators, so those people who earn their living from translation, have engaged in boundary work and tried to establish a discourse of occupational control. It makes sense. Uh, however, given the status of translation and translators, these um, Efforts do not appear to be have been um, successful everywhere. Uh, separating experts from non-experts establishes professional identities and institutionalizes a profession, but translation does not yet formally qualify as such in all fields. It is still the process of in the process of professionalization. What is more, there is also a considerable difference between the way translators see themselves and how they are perceived by others. 
translators are usually highly educated. Many translators are highly educated. And as Dam and Jetson write, they tend to see translation as an expert function requiring a high level of knowledge, skill and expertise. But this is a view that is not always shared by other people or non-translators. Indeed, many translators complain about low levels of appreciation, status and pay. Uh, and this situation might be explained by an unsuccessful discourse on translation expertise. Diamond Setchen Freit, uh, the general lack of awareness and recognition of the level of expertise required to translate may in fact be the overall reason why translator status is relatively low. So a perspective on expertise as a social and discursive construct it also is also relevant for scholars and translators who are interested in the professionalization of translation. In this context, sociology of knowledge could also provide some valuable starting points for the study of translation expertise. One example that springs to mind is Pfadenhauer's and Deeringer's notion of professionalism as institutionalized competence presentation competence. Professionalität as competence darstellungskompetence, as they write. Um, it builds on a staging theory perspective based on Goffman. It's grounded on the assumption that we cannot recognize social matters uh, or phenomena per se. We can only recognize presentations of them. Um, this applies not only to the immediate presentations in interactions, but also to the deeper institutionalized structures. So highly institutionalized professions have a variety of ways of presenting their competence, which in this approach consists of a combination of three components, qualification, willingness and responsibility to solve an existing problem. And this institutionalized presentation competence comprises the rendering visible of canonized expertise, conduct befitting the professional habitus, and evidence of qualifications and affiliation through education paths and certificates and uniforms maybe and so on. Uh, so I think this competence presentation competence also unites the two, two expertise dimensions that I discussed, this knowledge practices and discursive constructs. Uh, coming back um, to an established term in translation studies, we could also speak of expertise performance in a double sense of the term, namely in the skilled action and lived practices sense on the one hand, and as performance in the presenting, staging, acting sense of the other. Kaiser Koskinen also writes on the topic of interpreter performance as doing, being an interpreter in her 2020 book on translation and affect. Um, whether this performance is perceived as successful and appropriate is negotiated on a social level and, and it also ultimately depends on the power and status of the actors involved. Likewise, closely linked with the ascribing of expertise or competence is trust. If we ascribe expertise to someone, we have trust in that person's expertise. And I think this also highlights the relevance of translation research into trust that has been carried out, for example, by Abdallah and Koskinen, also for the topic of translation expertise. Right, to conclude, I believe that there are several ways to advance research on translation expertise. First of all, seeing lived expertise as expertise in context. Translation as a task or activity is multifaceted. It has changed and expanded drastically in recent years. And the challenges are becoming more diverse, also due to the technological progress, increasing structural complexity in a globalized and digitalized world. Um, 
even if we talk about doing a simple kind of single in the simple interlingual written translation, we know that it's not straightforward and it involves various factors, conditions and processes and be they cognitive, social, economic, political. Uh, de decades of uh, debates in our discipline can testify to this. this. Um, it has become almost a, almost a truism to see translation as situated and context bound. However, if we take this seriously, we need to incorporate context more sub substantially into our research on translation expertise too. The second point, uh, while the step from the lab to the field has already been taken for other topics, it is a move that is largely still to be made in the study of translation expertise. Still, it is an essential st step for looking at expertise embedded in its authentic contexts as it is lived every day. And it does not have to be limited to workplaces. It can include non-professional contexts, contexts on a mac macro level, or even the translation sector as a whole. For example, how does a translator navigate successfully through an op often precarious sector? What enables translation agencies to develop their strategy, their organizational strategy, and to attract and retain personnel and clients, a problem that we see uh, currently very strongly increasing. Uh, also, from a methodological perspective, it makes sense to focus both on what people do, for example, through observations, and also uh, the sense they make of it, for example, through interviews, focus groups, surveys, and so on. Um, while it seems now especially important to go beyond the quantifiable, a truly holistic picture will eventually result from combining different times of data and methods, both qualitative and quantitative. Greater openness is also called for, from a theoretical and conceptual perspective. Um, expertise research profits, of course, a lot from interdisciplinary approaches, uh, which should not be limited to adopting para paradigms from cognitive psychology. Diverse strands of cognitive science, sociology, philosophy offer plenty of food for thought. Uh, so, for example, this taking a step towards sociology uh, could prove fruitful, fr fruitful not only for expertise research, but also for cognitive translation and interpreting studies in general, as it shares much common, common ground regarding research topics and questions. Um, so, drawing inspiration from sociology of knowledge will allow us to integrate the dimension of the social and discursive construction of expertise and experts. Um, we advocate viewing expertise not merely as superior performance, but as performance in the double meaning of the term, including the social enactment and construction. We could even discuss expert action in the making as Sutton and Bicknell uh, call it, in this triple sense, in the making, in the interactive and embedded in embodied doing sense, also in the learning sense, what do I do uh, to get to where I want to be, and in the construction sense. The expertise, it's not something we have, it's something we do, and also socially and discursively do. Uh, Carr speaks here about various enactments of expertise. Another promising focus shift is that from ethic to emic, new and enriching perspectives can be found not only in science, but also in uh, cognitive science, but also in the uh, or translation studies, but also in the community that is being studied. We believe that it is important to take emic voices, insider voices seriously and to see how they can enri enrich theoretical debates. Um, and this does not need to be limited to professional translators. Um, so addressing new questions and revisiting old questions from new perspectives, um, there are many potential future research questions. We can, for example, um, investigate which 
skills are deemed important in authentic contexts and how they differ from or overlap with expertise indicators of experimental research or with comp competence models, we can approach adaptability or adaptive expertise in C2 and see how translators dynamically adjust to changing situations and to working with different tasks and clients and tools and so on. We can explore how translators interact with their environments and what contextual cues and clues they use to interpret a situation and activate the relevant embodied skills. We can take a look at the development of expertise which does not seem to uh, seem in the case of translation to be achieved to deliberate practice, mainly in a traditional sense. Uh, we can delve into the learning biographies and career paths of translators, if possible, even in longitudinal studies. I would love to read more of those. Um, and we can shed light on the emotional and social and trust-based aspects of expertise, like the process of ascribing translation expertise to certain people and practices and not to others. And also these links with identity and status and power. We can zoom in on the competence presentation competence of translators its institutionalization and the role played by universities, professional associations, and also other stakeholders in consolidating epistemic regimes, different international organizations, and so on. Um, and we can study the links between the different dimensions of expertise performance, between manifestation and construction, between acting as doing, acting as portraying to obtain this multi-layered socio-cognitive picture of translation expertise. And even this list is by no means exhaustive because many further topics would could emerge things we don't even know about yet because we will see them for the first time in the emic work uh, world at the workplace or whatever we might be observing and investigating thank you okay thank you professor risco for uh, this expert talk uh, a superior performance i think in a <laughs> difficult circumstance um with problem solving and a speedy recovery <laughs> in in real time. So thank you very much um, for uh, for thank yet you. another inspiring lecture. I'm sure there are questions. So we have um, we have some time for questions now. Um, you saw so it was cool. it was collaborative problem solving. <laughs> <laughs> Natalia has a question. Hi. Good morning. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the notion of paraprofessional translators and, and current research uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, the, in the dimension of, of your talk today. Because whenever I, I was reading the suggested um, readings and, and also with, with your lecture today, like all this social uh, construction and discursive construction of, of, of the translator and, 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 the, and the continuum between professional and non-professional, there is also this like dimension of being professional of another field, but working as a translator. So I don't know if, if there is current research or perhaps it's, it's from this lived experience and, and expertise, it's being um called in another way i don't know <laughs> thank you yes thank you for this addition actually because i didn't even mention paraprofessional translation and of course that would be exactly that kind of a field where we see translation expertise without it being called that by the people maybe uh by the people who who actually perform uh, superiorly in, in, in the field. So I would, I would really include that into, uh, first of all, in the definition of translation and also in 
uh, our research on practices where translation expertise is uh, being um, uh, is shown clearly shown. So um, I think it's uh, also from the discursive perspective, it's so interesting to to uh, discuss and to investigate the discourse that we have in 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 our own field also on localization transcreation and so on and we keep on reading that it's not only translating and of course in translation studies we have a uh, definitions of translation and we i think uh, many people today including myself used for definitions that that especially um uh emphasize that kind of Transla translational activity, so it's in, not included in any, excluded in any way. So uh, I think it's um, it's it's a really an own tradition already in translation studies, and then I think it's uh, very relevant for uh, studying expertise in translation, even if it's not the uh, traditional professional translation field you might think of. Thank you. David? Yes, good morning. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, towards the end of your lecture, you said that translation and expertise is not something that we have, it's something that we do. And I just wondered, if any research has been carried out on the concept of expertise between different language pairs, because anecdotally, I can just share an, an experience that would seem to challenge that point on one level at least. Um, I did work for a time as an in-house translator in a translation agency, and my language pair is French to English, which at least in the eyes of the translation agency was not considered very prestigious. So we were like two a penny and our expertise was assessed in terms of output and in terms of adaptability. So we were expected to translate anything from marketing material to patents with the same level of output expected in all cases mm -hmm. whereas occasionally we got a job from a rare language pair and there was no in-house translator so they had to outsource it to a freelancer and normally when this particular agency did that they would want the same output and the same flexibility from the freelancer as well but there was a job that had to be done from Bulgarian into English, which there's not a whole load of English people who are professionally skilled in Bulgarian. And uh, none of the output criteria were applied in the case of this translator. And I was by that time getting a bit ground off by having my performance assessed in terms of output. So I dared to <laughs> query this with a project manager. And she said, oh, we can't apply all that in his case because he's an expert. He translates from Bulgarian. Right. So right. The, yeah. But does it depend on language pair? I could say that much more simply. <laughs> yes, language pair and the situation in which this language pair is the rare one. In other contexts, it might be the, the default case. So uh, you gave us a wonderful example of how uh, trans translators are uh, measured by using different criteria. They might be, they might look very straightforward and standardized and well defined. But as soon as there's a case that doesn't somehow uh, uh, comply with the uh, the default case, other criteria are used. So, um, so yeah, I think. That that makes sense, yeah. 
Nice, nice example, actually. Yeah, and I, I think in my next lecture, where I will be telling you about uh, our research results um, on how translators are being uh, evaluated or uh, chosen actually, actually for different jobs of translators, um, how um, heads of departments or agency CEOs choose uh, translators, I think uh, you will see, you will maybe recognize something there. I'm curious to hear what you say, whether you have actually experienced exactly similar uh, situations and, and, and requirements. Thank you very much. Okay, and we'll take one last question from Stelios. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Hannah. Um, very interesting, um, mind blowing, I would say, and I'm a bit sort of perplexed with all this information pouring in, but but great as ever lecture. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things now. Um, on the basis of your previous lectures, is is non-human translation being taken into account in the expertise uh, in discussion? because there we may have also in the near future uh, quite a few things to say about what, uh, what, how to define expertise, because I think you focused um, predominantly on, on, on human translation, obviously, uh, in this lecture at least. Um, that is one thing. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, struck me was um, exactly uh, when you were uh, talking about professionalism, and, and the relationship between expertise and professionalism. Um, I, I do think that um, these are two different issues, quite separate, uh, I suppose. So we may have an expert outside the realm of professional translation. And this is exactly what has been said by Natalia as well. I mean, expert in, in specific fields, jargons or science, sciences may come into play as a translator very much needed, whereas no other translation or professional translation expertise can be offered. And I think this is key. And um, I forgot the third point, I'm afraid. <laughs> but this is old age. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, yes. Um... What you mentioned, the non-human translation, um, maybe some maybe some uh, scholars would um, would also call, call it post-human translation. I do I do include the human being into the loop because uh, I'm talking about translation expertise. And as seen as embodied and extended and so on, it's it includes both the human beings and the uh, the social interaction and the material interaction, including the technology. So the unit is that kind of an assemblage of uh, a socio-technical assemblage, like you see it also in uh, actor network theory, for example. And uh, when you look at the uh, today's um, uh, machine translation products, uh, they, as I mentioned in the first lecture, they 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 are already very much uh, able to um, simulate this neural network idea, the neural machine translation. But the idea of extended and uh, embodied translation, uh, that is still in the making. So we will see how much of that uh, experience-based, um, co co cooperation-based uh, expertise acquire, um, acquisition, um, how, how much of that will be um, actually uh, simulated later on in the in the further um, uh, for the further tools. So I would not actually ascribe uh, translation expertise in that sense, what I was talking of today, to non-human translation only, but yes, to this collaboration with uh, also neural machine, machine translation tools. Um, and yes, I would keep uh, well, in, in my work, of course, you can define uh, um, concepts differently and you can say that I'm using in my research, I'm using professionalism and expertise as a common term. Um, 
but in my research, I, I find it very useful to separate them, to really uh, talk about professional translators when they are paid and they work as translators or other labels. Of course, there are a huge number of labels like language ex experts and so on. Um, uh, uh, and that, that's their professional role. And then this expertise, this discourse and practice might be something different. And it's uh, it's a it's a more broad idea of also other people being able to um, perform that and and um, uh, be accepted as experts and also uh, providing and producing high quality products, people that would not call themselves uh, professional translators. So yes, I do keep them apart. Okay, um, thank you for a lovely discussion. Thank you again, Hannah. Um, for the participants and members of the teaching staff, um, we will take a short break now and we'll reconvene at 11.45 uh, Brussels time for our first participant panel. Um, so grab a coffee, stretch your legs, and we'll uh, meet up again for the participants and for our guests visiting. Um, have a lovely day. Thanks again, Hannah, uh, and see you in a minute. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.